Welcome. I'd like to talk to you today a little bit more about graphing quadratic equations. And this time, instead of graphing quadratic equations written in standard form, we're going to graph quadratic equations that are written in vertex form, which I can elaborate on a little bit more down here because I'm telling you that our goal is to graph quadratic equations written in the form f of x is equal to a times x minus h squared plus k. And so then that would be the vertex form of a quadratic function. Now I'd like to start off our discussion by revisiting an idea that we were working with in a previous chapter where you learned to graph absolute value functions. And you see right now I've got an equation of an y equals absolute value of x and I've got the most basic absolute value function graphed right here on the screen. And so what I wanted to remind you of is how you were able to take that basic absolute value function graph or that parent function right there and you were able to manipulate it in various ways using addition, subtraction, and or multiplication. All right. For instance, remember that you were able to translate um, absolute value equations. If I wanted the, uh, to translate the function, say, three units to the right, for instance, well, then I could put in parentheses x minus three, or in other words, I could subtract three from the input value of the function, Whoops, that's not what I want right there. I can subtract 3 from the input value of the function, and you can see the result is it gave me a graph that was 3 units to the right. Now, if I went and I changed that to, instead of minus 3, if I change it to plus 4, you see how that moves the graph to the left 4 units. So we're able to do horizontal translations, and we're also able to do vertical translations, if you recall, if we would add or subtract from the output value. So for instance, if I took the absolute value of x and then I added 6 at the end, well, you can barely see that on the screen right there, but this graph simply translated 6 units up. And if I wanted to take that and change it to subtraction, say minus 1, well, then I would get the same graph as a parent function, but it would be translated 1 unit down. Okay. And then the last thing we could do was instead of using addition or subtraction, we could multiply the original function by a few different things to get different results. For instance, if I wanted to reflect this graph in the x-axis, all I had to do was multiply by negative 1. And you can see that it gave me a reflection in the x-axis. Or I could make the graph narrower or wider by multiplying by other values. For instance, if I multiplied by 5, it made the graph narrower, right? Or it had a vertical stretch, is what I want to say. And if I multiplied it, say, by 0.5, well, it would have been a vertical stretch still, but it would have been something we called a compression, because how the graph got wider. Now, my point is that we use addition and subtraction and multiplication to manipulate absolute value, the graphs of absolute value functions. We can do the same to manipulate the graphs of quadratic functions. And I want to show you that really quickly. Here I've got the graph of y equals x squared, uh, the parent function for quadratic functions. And we've already talked about how that's going to give you a parabola and so forth. But what I want to do is I'm going to show you how applying the same principles that we did to absolute value functions, we can make transformations out of quadratic functions or really any other types of functions we want to. For instance, if I wanted a graph that would take um, y, this original parent function and translate it to the right, well, what I can do is I can add or subtract from the input value. In other words, before I square, I could subtract 4, say. Now let me put the squaring on. And what it did then was it translated the graph of y equals x squared 4 units to the right. Is that minus 4? four units to the right. Or if I wanted to translate it to the left, all I had to do was make it plus one. That would go one unit to the left, for instance. I guess I just did plus 14. Let me make it plus one. So, real easy to do horizontal translations with quadratic functions, the same way you did with absolute value functions. And then, of course, if I wanted to translate one unit to the left and I wanted to go down three units, well, then I could put a minus 5, I could do subtraction after the squaring occurred, right? All right. And if I wanted to, oh, let me say minus 1 with that. Say I wanted a downward facing parabola. 
Well, then I could just multiply the output value by a negative sign. Or if I wanted a narrower parabola, I could multiply by something like 3, something like that. So multiplication, addition, and subtraction still want to manipulate the graphs of a quadratic function the same way that they did for um, absolute value functions. Now, let's talk a little bit more about that idea. And there's really one thing that I want to get across to you with it. Um, I want to look at how you can transform the graph of y equals x squared. And let's talk about some main properties of the graph of y equals x squared. And then the translations will make sense to you from there, I believe. First of all, the graph of y equals x squared has the vertex at 0, 0. You notice that it was at the origin. And also, I could say that its axis of symmetry, which I'm going to start abbreviating right now for this video, the axis of symmetry was the y-axis, or the line x is equal to 0. Okay, well, vertex form. Whenever you have a, a quadratic function written in the form y equals a times x minus h squared plus k, that's called the vertex form. And there's a very simple reason it's called the vertex form, and that's because when a quadratic equation is written in vertex form, you can just look and immediately identify the coordinates of the vertex. Now, you notice that whenever we add or subtracted from the input value, or add or subtracted before the squaring took place in the function, that was a horizontal translation, right? And whenever you add or subtract it after the squaring took place, then you're getting some kind of vertical translation. So, if I subtract h from the input value and I add k to the output value, how does that change this vertex? Well, it's going to go h units horizontally, and it's going to move k units vertically, so that we can say the vertex, when you have an equation written in vertex form, is simply h comma k. All right, and then the axis of symmetry is always going to have the same x coordinate as the vertex. You might remember that from our standard form video. So the axis of symmetry would be the line x is equal to h. All right, <clears throat> so you're going to see some vertex form equations, and you're going to find that it's very easy to identify where the vertex is. And if you can identify where the vertex is and the axis of symmetry, <coughs> excuse me, then it's going to be very easy to make the graphs of quadratic equations. All right, let's try some examples. So you see our vertex form equation that we're going to be graphing. Y, essentially, equals negative 3 times the square of x plus 1 plus 4. Now, whenever I was working with standard form equations, I always wanted to identify the values of a, b, and c. Right off the bat, whenever I'm working with vertex form equations, I want to identify the values of a, h, and k. Now, the a in vertex form has exactly the same effect that it did in standard form. So, for instance, the fact that a is negative means I'm going to have a parabola that opens down. And we care about whether this parabola opens down. And so, let me go ahead and write that. We know that this parabola is going to open downward. And you kind of saw me demonstrate that a little bit ago, how that would work out. Then we also want to identify the values of h and k. Now, remember that where h is, it's supposed to be in the form x minus h. So if I was subtracting something, then h would be positive. But if I've got addition here, that means h is negative. Really, h is negative 1. h is always going to have the opposite sign of what you see in those parentheses there for this vertex form. And then k is what's at the end. It's the uh, exact value that you see right there because it's normally in the form a times x minus h squared plus k. I didn't mean to write a 4 right there. I meant to write a k. All right. So we figured out that the parabola opens downward. Now, I told you that the easiest thing to learn about the graph of an equation written in vertex form is where its vertex is because the vertex is simply going to be the values of h and k. So the vertex here would be negative 1. So you'll want to know where the vertex is when you're graphing a parabola. You also want to know where the axis of symmetry is. And the axis of symmetry always is going to go through the x-coordinate for the vertex. It's going to be the line x equals h, we said, or x equals negative 1 in this case. All right. And then also, we're going to talk about how you might find a y-intercept, except 
that y-intercepts here aren't quite so easy as they were with the standard form of equation. But let's go ahead and find a y-intercept for this. Now, remember anytime you're trying to find a y-intercept, what you're doing is you're finding out what y is when x is equal to 0. So, to show you that the y-intercept is not just going to be 4, it's not just a constant value at the end when you have it written in vertex form, I'm going to go ahead and show you what you get when you plug in 0 into the function. We would then have negative 3 times 0 plus 1 squared plus 4. Now, you follow your order of operations. You're going to get 0 plus 1 is 1, and 1 squared is 1, and 1 times negative 3 is negative 3, and then negative 3 plus 4 is 1. And so that what's, what that tells me is that the y-intercept is the point 0, 1. Very important to realize that the y-intercept and the y-coordinate for the vertex here, k, are not going to be the same values under 99% of the circumstances. Okay, well, we've got enough information written down here in order to be able to graph this parabola. I'm going to go ahead and graph the axis of symmetry. I'll graph the vertex and the y-intercept, and then we should be able to make the rest of the graph with no problem. So you see our line x equals um, negative 1. Now, as before I go ahead and graph the vertex and axis of symmetry, let's, let's look at the y-coordinates there, 4 and 1. I can easily go by 1s and fit both of those values, so I'll go ahead and graph them. Um, negative 1, 4 right here is my vertex, and 0, 1 right here, that is a point on the right side of the graph. It's a y-intercept, and so we know the right half of the parabola going to look something like that. And then remember the way you make the other half of the parabola is you make the mirror image of the half that you have in the opposite side. And the easiest way to start is to make the mirror image of your y-intercept. So the mirror image of my y-intercept would be one unit to the left of the axis of symmetry. Since it was one unit to the right, let's put a point here. And we've got the other half of our parabola right there. So very easy to graph a quadratic function that's written in vertex form. You still have to know does it open up or down, and mainly that's so you don't get surprises. All right, we didn't get any surprises. It was what we thought, but then you graph the axis of symmetry, the vertex, and the y-intercept, and it works just as well as the standard form. You just didn't have to do the opposite of b over 2a. All right, I want to show you one more example. And what's going to be interesting about this example is that it's hard to distinguish between whether this is standard form or vertex form. All right? And so what I mean is we don't really know for sure, just looking at the equation, whether this is in the form y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, or whether it's in the form y is equal to a times x minus h squared plus k. And the reason we don't know which one it is is because we can make an argument for either of those being the case. For instance, if we wanted to say that this function was y equals one-fifth x squared plus zero x, oops, that's supposed to be x squared, plus zero x plus c, then we could say it's written in standard form, but your b is equal to zero. But we could just as easily say that it's y equals one-fifth, times x minus 0 squared minus 3. I meant to put a minus 3 right here earlier. And so we could make the argument that this is in vertex form, but h is 0. All right, well, really either one of those things is going to be true, all right? I promise no matter which method you choose to graph this, you're going to find out that the vertex is exactly in the same place, the axis of symmetry exactly in the same place. But if I'm going to choose between those two forms, I'm going to choose vertex form because, first of all, I know exactly where the vertex is. I can tell from looking at the equation that the vertex here would be 0, negative 3. And so I'm going to go ahead and graph 0, negative 3. And, by the way, if the vertex is on the y-axis, that means the y-axis is your axis of symmetry. Well, so that brings up one more challenge because normally I tell you to graph the vertex and it's off to one of the sides somewhere, and then I tell you the axis of symmetry, and you're able to make one half of a parabola. But since the point that we know is already on the axis of symmetry, we're going to have to make another point on either side of the graph. So, in order to do that, and I'm, this is exactly what I'm trying to teach you here with this example, is what do you do if the axis of symmetry is a y-axis, 
if that's the case, then what you're going to do is you're just going to plug in one other point into the function that's on either side. Now, I'm going to plug in 5 just because I'm thinking ahead and I'm saying, well, if I plug in 5, I'll have a 5 squared right there, and it's easy to multiply 1 fifth times 5 squared. So, I could have plugged in anything I wanted to, but I chose to plug in 5. Now, that will give me 1 fifth times 5 minus 0, or 5 squared minus 3. So that's a fifth of 25, which is 5, and 5 minus 3 is 2. So I know that the point 5, comma, 2, when x is 5, when x is 5, we determine that y is 2. So I can plot that point now. 3, 4, 5, 2, right there. Whoops. Right there. And so I've got the left half, sorry, the right half of my parabola. Just make sure you make a parabolically shaped. Don't try to make a straight line through there. Good. And then I can use the whole mirror image thing that we've been talking about, um, except I'm making a mirror image in the y-axis. Now, this point here is 5 units away from the y-axis, so its mirror image will be 5 units on the other side right there. So plot that point. you got the rest of your parabola. All right, so now you know how to graph vertex form quadratic equations. A pretty simple thing to do, something I expect you to be proficient at. Thank you. See you later.